Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for life and health. We give you thanks, O oh God, for this moment and for this church. We pray, God, that as we are about to build on a firm foundation, we pray, God, that you would help us to start with what we have, to celebrate where we are, and to know that it may require a different structure. And so uphold me now that I may preach Christ and Christ alone for salvation. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, of strength and our Redeemer. And the people of God say, amen. amen and amen. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. I greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, head of the church and Savior of the entire world. I'd like you to turn to the person to your left and ask them, what foundation are you building on? Turn to the body to the next side. What foundation are you building on? What foundation? And I want you to say, I'm building on a firm foundation. This morning, my dear brothers and sisters, we're going to be reflecting on the theme, building on a firm foundation. Building on a firm foundation. And we're going to be looking at just one portion of scripture that was read to us from the book of Ezra, chapter 3, verse 1 to 12. And if you permit me, I'll read it quickly one more time for us. It says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites were in the towns, the people gathered together in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, with his kin, set out to build the altar of God and to offer burnt offerings upon it. They set up the altar on its foundation because they were afraid of the neighboring peoples, and they offered burnt offerings to the Lord morning and evening. And they had kept the festival of boots as prescribed and offered daily burnt offerings according to their ordinance as required for each day. And after that, regular burnt offerings and offerings at the new moon and all the sacred festivals and all the offerings who made a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day to the seventh month, they began birth offerings to the Lord. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. So they gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrenians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the ground that they had gotten. In the second year after their arrival at the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month of, Jer of, of, the, of the year, Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel and Joshua son of Jehozadak made a beginning together with the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites, who had come up to Jerusalem from captivity. They appointed the Levites from 20 years upward to have oversight of the house of the Lord. And Joshua with his sons and his skin, and all of them took charge of the house of the Lord. When the builders laid the foundation, the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with their trumpets, with their cymbals, according to King David. And they sang, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And all the people responded with a great shout. But when they praised the Lord, the foundation of the house was laid. But many of the priests and the Levites, heads of old families, who had seen the house on its old foundations, wept with a loud voice. Though many shouted for joy, so that the people's voices could not be distinguished. For the people shouted so loudly that it was heard from a far away. What foundation are you building on? My dear brothers and sisters, life is about a foundation. We are here today in church with this lovely chapel and it is built on a foundation. People say that any good relationship is built on a good foundation of communication and trust and so on. I know that many of the, you all women here today you all may know what a good foundation is because you know about your makeup, right? You know your makeup. And so many women, when you put on your makeup, the first thing you put on is your foundation, whether it's your eyeliner, whether it's your um, blush, whether it's your um, rose. Foundations are important. 
And without a foundation, my dear brothers and sisters, life tends to crumble. And in the story that was just read, the Jews had a desire to build on a strong foundation. And I want to set the stage for us here today. These Jews, my dear brothers and sisters, they had just come back from captivity. They spent about 50 years in Babylon, and they had just came back to Jerusalem to build over their country. And so for us today, my dear brothers and sisters, to put that in context, imagine us who are here today. We are Barbadians. We live in Barbados, but we've been taken away to Grenada for about 50 years. And then after 50 years, we've just come back from Grenada to Barbados, ready to start and build over our life. We can't wait to eat Shafet. We can't wait to build over our houses. We can't wait to be able to enjoy all the um, independence festivities. And we've come back here right now, and the town is destroyed. The Jews came back to Jerusalem, and they left a country that was filled with buildings, with a booming economy, and they came back to a world and a country that had absolutely nothing. And these Jews, my dear brothers and sisters, they decided to themselves that even though there is no foreign currency in the economy, even though there's nothing happening in, the, in their land, even though life as they know it is over, they say to themselves, we have to begin to start again. And we are told, my dear brothers and sisters, that as they have come back from Babylon, they have said to themselves, first thing is first, we need to build over our temple. And we are told, my dear brothers and sisters, that the first thing that the Jews would have created or would have built back over is the altar. And I want us to understand the significance of this altar. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, for the Jews, their first temple, which was destroyed, was over 80 feet tall, over 140 feet wide, and they had the most wonderful pews, the most wonderful decorations, but it all was destroyed. And they had absolutely no money to build it over again. But we are told, my dear friends, that as they are once again in their country, they decided and they realized that there are many people in and around their community who have temples erected to other gods. And for the Jews, they themselves understood that in order for them to begin their life aright, they had to build their altar. And the significance of this, my dear brothers and sisters, is that for, the, for those people at that time, a place of worship is not just something that represents something you do on a one-off, but rather to have a place of worship, to offer up sacrifices, is a political move, is a move of war. Because you see, my dear friends, for those people at that time to win a war meant that your God was greater than anyone else's God. And so the Jews understood that even though they had enemies who were all around them, enemies who would have offered offerings all around them, they recognized that even though they didn't have money to build back their temple as they once knew it, they recognized that we're going to have to do what we can do with what we have at our disposal. And they said to themselves, we are going to set up our altar. We may not have the grand, um, grand pews that we once had, but we're going to set up our altar. They said to themselves that it may not be as beautiful as we once had it, but we're going to set up our altar. They said to themselves, we're not going to have all of the lush um, trimmings that we once had, but we're going to set up our altar. Because for them, my dear brothers and sisters, they recognized that the foundation of their life was God. They understood that the foundation of their life was a life submitted to Jesus Christ. And they said to themselves, we don't have everything perfect, but we're going to start with the foundation. And I want to say to us today, my dear brothers and sisters, for us who are in this world, for us who have our lives, for us who are in the midst of crises, maybe God is saying to you and maybe God is saying to me, where are you starting from? 
God is saying, what are you going to begin to base the foundation of your life? My dear brothers and sisters, for all of us in life today, we all have lofty dreams. We all have plans of where our life should be, where I need to be at 25, where I need to be at 45, where I need to be at 55. We all have plans and dreams of the kind of car we want to have, the kind of house we want to have, the kind of life we want to have, where we go to school, where our children go to school, what we live, where we go on vacation. And quite often, my dear brothers and sisters, oftentimes in life, life does not pan out or manifest itself in the way that we initially, initially desire it. Especially, my dear friends, coming out of a time of crisis. But what I realize, my dear brothers and sisters, in a time of crisis, we recognize what is most important in life. Think about it in a fire, if a house is burning down. The things that you gravel up the most as you are coming out of the fire are the most important things. Yes or no? When we, when we may have someone who is sick in our family, my dear brothers and sisters, and we have to rush them to the hospital, we don't think about to wear our best clothes, or we don't think about if our makeup is well done. All that matters is that we have on clothes, and we take up our phones, and that we have the most important things, and we start from there. Oftentimes in life, my dear brothers and sisters, a crisis dictates to us or a crisis shows us what is most important. A crisis says to us that I don't have time to dilly-dally. I only have time to take up that which is most important and we can realize what is the most important needs in our lives. And if we understand, my dear brothers and sisters, a foundation is one large block. And I believe that as the Jews would have set the altar on that foundation, they said to themselves, we're going to deal with our life one thing at a time. And so for us as individuals trying to make the best out of ourselves, there are so many aspects of our lives that we want to make better. We say to ourselves, well, I want to get to the gym. When I finish my first job, I want to start my small business. I want to be able to see all my friends. I want to be able to pay off my loan. I want to be able to do X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And we find ourselves oftentimes very stretched and very frazzled at moments. But perhaps this passage is saying to us, maybe we need to focus on one thing. What is the most critical aspect of your life that needs focus. For us today, my dear brothers and sisters, in our family lives, what is the most important aspect that we need to be focusing on? In our church, my dear brothers and sisters, there are so many things that we can be doing, but I also believe this question, this passage is posing to us, what is the most important thing that we need to be focusing at this time? And I believe, my dear brothers and sisters, coming out of our 90-day blitz, we can pick something that is most important. We have the home visitations. We have the home Bible study groups. We have the prayer meeting sessions. We have the emphasis on youth and children work. We have the comeback events. Perhaps God is saying at this time, we may have the regular, schmegular, regular things that we do as church, but God is saying maybe we need to stop and slow down and pick one thing to focus on. Pick one thing to pour all of our time into. And maybe you'll see that that one thing which is most critical may bring the most amount of change in your life. So I say to you, let us start with the foundation. Start with one thing. Secondly, my dear friends, I also believe that we must celebrate the foundation. Verses 10 to 11 says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with cymbals, according to the direction of King David of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising the Lord and giving thanks, for they said, For he is good, and for his steadfast love endures forever. And all the people responded with a great joy when they praised the Lord for the foundation of the Lord had been laid. You see, my dear friends, as the Jews came back from 
Babylon, as I would have said to you, they had no money, no savings, nothing in their economy. And so they would have saved up all of their money, had circuit pastoral council, district meetings, and said, we're going to do this the right way. We're going to lay the foundation first. And we are told, my dear friends, that it took two years for them to lay the foundation. And after they would have taken two years to just simply lay this boring foundation, they had a dedicatory service. And all of their pastors came in their robes. The praise and worship team came to play songs. People sang and had a good time. But all they had was the foundation. And I thought about it, my dear brothers and sisters. Here it is. The first temple was over 80 feet tall, 140 feet wide. The temple had gold. The temple had silver. The temple had the latest technology. But here it is. They were celebrating not a building, but simply a slab of stone. And I thought about it and I said, what are they doing here? I realized, my dear brothers and sisters, that they recognized that they needed to appreciate where they were at. Even though they had not completed their dream, even though they hadn't gotten where they wanted to get, even though it was just the foundation, it was something that they needed to big up and something that they needed to lift up. And it says to me, my dear brothers and sisters, that they were looking back at their lives because they said to themselves that for 50 years we were slaves, but now we're free. For 50 years we had not lived in our own country, but now we're back. For 50 years we were not where God had established us, but even though we're back at home, things are not perfect, things are not how it's supposed to be, money isn't as flowing as it once was, we are going to celebrate because this foundation is a victory. And it says to me, my dear brothers and sisters, that they were practicing gratitude, or rather they were harvesting gratitude. And it says to me, my dear brothers and sisters, that for them coming out of a crisis, the only way for them to be able to deal with all that life had to offer was to celebrate the little things. And so I want to ask us a question. Do we take time to celebrate the foundations that we have laid in our lives? Have we practiced gratitude and harvested gratitude for where we have come from, especially when we have come out of a crisis. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, we all want to go reach higher. We all want to do better. We all want to have dreams that we accomplish. And for many of us, my dear brothers and sisters, we have a timeline as to when these things are supposed to happen. We have a timeline as to when life is supposed to make sense, when you're supposed to have your house, when you're supposed to have your car, when you're supposed to be married, when you're supposed to retire, when you're supposed to go on vacation. And we have all of these lofty expectations. But oftentimes, my dear brothers and sisters, especially when we have long-term plans in our lives, there comes a moment where we need to stop up in the middle and appreciate where we have come from. Many of us, my dear brothers and sisters, we say to ourselves, well, you know, um, this year is going to be a year when I get a new car, a brand new car, a BMW, and when we are walking on the road and catching the ZRs, we're saying to ourselves, I can't wait till I get this big time car. But we may find ourselves, we don't have that BMW, we may not have that RAV4, but we have an old beat up Corolla. And we say to ourselves, man, I ain't like this car, this car old and brought down. And, but we have to think about it. Last year I was walking. This year I'm driving. It may not be the car I want, but I've made steps to go forward. We may say to ourselves, well, for those of us who may be older, we may find ourselves in need of surgery, not able to walk, and we may say to ourselves, well, after I get this surgery, I should be able to walk, jump and skip, but we are at a point now in our healing when we, all we can do is hobble along with a cane, and we can be saying to ourselves, man, I supposed to be walking now, I supposed to be running now. No, 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 no. God is saying, pause. Remember, you couldn't walk before. Appreciate that you're crawling now. Appreciate that you're taking small baby steps. 
appreciate in your marriage perhaps my dear brothers and sisters in your marriage you and your spouse may not be at the best terms may not be at that place where you guys believe you should be but perhaps last year you were ready to get divorced perhaps last year you're ready to give up and God is saying things in your marriage may not be perfect right now but things are getting better so appreciate where you've come from Appreciate where God is taking you. We have to look, my dear brothers and sisters, of where we have come from as a world and as a country. Coming out of 2018 with the economic crisis in Barbados, then COVID, then volcano ash, then trying to get back things to where we want them to be. We have come through a lot. Things are not where we want them to be, but we're here trying and fighting. And so it says to me, do we appreciate where God has taken us from? You see, my dear brothers and sisters, to be able to have this gratitude beyond a spiritual principle also helps us mentally. Because you see, when you take stock of what you have, and when you take stock of where you come from, you wouldn't be as bitter. When you take stock of where you've come from and take stock of what you've overcome, you, my brothers and sisters, you're going to not have to deal with compassion fatigue. You're not going to have to deal with empathy fatigue. When you think about where you've come from, you can say to yourself, well, boy, last year I was here, but now I'm there. There is growth. And so God is saying, just as how the Israelites would have made a big deal of a simple foundation, we need to make a big deal of where we are right now. So will you jump for joy at the foundation? Will you jump for joy at the old car? Will you jump for joy at the walker? Will you jump for joy at your church? That though our church may not be where we think it needs to be, we're getting somewhere. And lastly, my dear friends, same foundation, different structure. Same foundation, different structure. Verse 12 to 13 says, But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the families, all people who had seen the first house on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw the house, though many shouted for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the, sound of the shouts of joy from the people's weeping. So I want us to understand this, right? There are a group of people who have just come back from slavery. You have half of them are about 70 years old, and the other half of them are below that. Those of them who are above 70 years old would have lived in Israel before slavery, and then they left. The other half of them, all they knew was life in Babylon. And so both of them have come together right now and built this foundation. And half of them are happy, and half of them are sad. May see, my dear brothers and sisters, the half of the people who were sad remembered what the first temple looked like. And when they see that the temple was destroyed, they were sad because they said to themselves, this does not look like how I remember it to be. But those who were happy, even though they were not sad, they did not understand the significance of what was lost. And so there is this sort of a wrestling in the people of Israel because it's like half of me is happy, but half of me is sad. And I recognize, my dear brothers and sisters, that the second temple was not like the first. The second temple was smaller. The second temple was not as beautiful, but it was the same foundation, different structure. I'm going to say it again. Same foundation different structure and it says to me that their life was different their life was changing but it was changing for the better even if some of them were not happy about it and it says to me my dear brothers and sisters that life is not going to allow us to recapture the lost dreams that we had Life is not going to be perfect, just as how we remember it when we were younger. But when life gives us a foundation, let us build a new structure, because life is not lived in the past, life is lived in the future. So I want to ask you here today, 
do we know that the foundation of life will be the same, but the outer structure will be different? You know, they said that the hardest thing to build in a, a house is the foundation. The building itself can be destroyed, but because of the depth that the foundation is built in and because of the way that the foundation is made, it takes a very strong act of nature to destroy a foundation. And my dear brothers and sisters, I think about the people of Israel and I think about their temple because it's not simply about a building because the building represents the presence of God. And so the foundation, which is God, remains the same. Their understanding of God is different. And it says to me, my dear friends, that they had to wrestle with their new realities of life with the same God. And for us today, we may have to wrestle with new realities, new problems, new issues, but I want you to know you have the same God. When we think about the human being, we go through many stages of life. We start off short, we get taller. Some of us, our voice gets deeper. Some of us, our arms become bigger. Some of us, we, um, we change as an individual physically, but it is easy for us to change physically, but internally, psychologically, the very morals that we have seldom change. And so it says to me, my dear friends, that we are not going to change the physical structure of James Street. We're not going to change the physical structure of our churches. But what it says to us is that our inner culture as Christians needs to and has to and will change. I want to say to you that this metaphorical church that we're building within ourselves is not going to be the same church that our grandparents grew up in. The way we do church is not going to be or cannot be the same way our parents did church. The church that we're building cannot be the way that we grew up in church. But it must be the way that the future generations will live in church. Same foundation, different structure. And it says to me, my dear friends, we're going to be a little uncomfortable with how church is going to be. And I'm going to take my time and I'm going to tread very lightly here right now. Because, my dear friends, for us to become the new church, it means things are going to have to be broached that have never been broached before. We have to deal with issues of sexuality. And I'm going to take my time with this and speak very clearly. We believe what we want to believe as Christians. We know that God has ordained marriage between man and woman and we are not going to compromise on that. And we must understand that as a church, we may be grappling with the reality of homosexuality, still wrestling with that. But I want to say to you that the world has moved far beyond that. The world has moved far beyond just simple wrestlings with same-sex marriage. They're dealing with gender fluidity. The world is dealing with gender identity. And I want to say to you that it's going to cause us not to compromise. We are not going to compromise what we believe, but it means we're going to have to engage persons like that, bring them in closer, who may be of that persuasion. And can you imagine what our church will look like if we come alongside persons like that? It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be different. We're not going to compromise what we believe, but we have to come alongside and journey Everybody's got quiet with me here right now. When we think about it in terms of our culture, my dear brothers and sisters, as Caribbean people, particularly in Barbados, what we play on our music, on the radio, there's a very, we take very keen interest in making sure that certain lyrics aren't played on, on the radio, certain things aren't said, which is good. There are bands on certain artists coming into the island, coming into the region, who sing particular songs, which is good. But at the same time, my dear brothers and sisters, we must understand that there's another war being fought. We must understand that there's cyber spying going on. And I want to say to you that you know and I know it. We can be having a simple conversation about dogs and our phone is here. And we go up on social media. We never search dogs, but every ad is about a dog. We never search about a car, but we say we want a new car. Every ad is about a car. Cyber spying, 
We say to ourselves, my dear brothers and sisters, that we may be thinking we're getting our things done here, physically, but when we look at around the world, there have been tribunals against certain social media um, platforms that may be state-run, that may be state-run to um, ensure that their algorithms um, show certain things to our children. We must understand that the enemy, not rather, rather what YouTube is fighting against is not anyone in particular but your sleep. And so what YouTube is trying to do, YouTube is saying, we're gonna structure an algorithm to ensure that every video keeps you up Every video tells you what you want to hear. Every video is going to um, usher a different understanding of what you might want to hear about. My dear friends, I don't have all of the answers. But I say to you, we as a church, we're going to have to embrace the different structures of the world. Our world is becoming more diverse. Our world is becoming more advanced. Our world is becoming more technical. And I want to say to you, the only way we can save our children's children is if we begin to understand the complexities of where we are. Same foundation, different structure. So I want to remind us here today, my dear friends, as we are building on a new foundation, I want to say to you, start with it. Start where you are. Things may not be perfect, but start with what is most important. Celebrate the foundation, my dear friends. Celebrate the milestones that you have achieved in your life. And my dear brothers and sisters, understand that it's the same foundation, different structure. We are not compromising what we believe, but understand it's gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna be technical, but we have to reach out and change because our church cannot stay the same, but it must change to meet the needs of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.